and welcome to our program, what we call GSO's Ocean Classroom Live, where we connect audiences to ocean science through conversation. So in this program, we're gonna wrap our mini series as we've been focusing on research at sea in the RCRV program or the Regional Class Research Vessel Program. Now these RCRVs are cutting edge and modern vessels for ocean science. Before we get into our topics today, I just wanna say a couple thanks. We wanna thank our, the Devereux Ocean Foundation for funding this episode. And we also wanna thank you for being here with us. So in doing that, let us know where you're watching from. Write it in the chat, wherever you're watching, and we'll pull that up a little bit later. So for our topic today, we're all on this boat together. Here in the US, we have an academic research fleet that takes scientists, engineers, technicians, teachers, communicators, and artists to see so that we can explore, learn from, and captivate people with compelling stories of the ocean and the many ways in which we are intimately connected to it. So these RCRVs are gonna join this US academic research fleet. And in doing so, they're gonna represent a major update to it. And they're gonna enable research and exploration on the Western, Eastern, and Southerly U US coasts in completely new ways. And at the same time, as we will touch on today, the mission of these vessels is not purely scientific. We also must recognize an imbalance in access and how one may or may not perceive that access to participate and feel that connection to the sea. So in our first program, we talked about what may be enabled with these research vessels, their capabilities, really from an aerial perspective. Our second drove us towards how scientists, technicians, and others find ways to collaborate while working at sea, and that revealing a sense that there's no one way to participate and there's no one way to be connected to it. Today, we'll go further into what participation means and how access can manifest as an entry point or as barriers for physical spaces, but also how one's own possibilities can be perceived, influencing important life-altering decisions along the way. And today's episode, like every single one before us, is gonna be archived online and our podcast is available on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. So this third vessel in the RCRV program, it carries the namesake of Dr. Gilbert Rutledge Mason Sr., who was a pioneering civil rights leader and practicing physician to the Mariner community along the Gulf Coast. The slogan for this ship is Aquamare, which is a Latin phrase meaning equal access to the sea. And it honors his life work and his legacy so this ship will explore, study, and map the U.S. Gulf Coast and the Caribbean, increasing accessibility to this underexplored region in different ways. So our first guest today represents a continuation in many different ways of Dr. Gilbert Mason's legacy, the sponsor of the ship, and the only granddaughter of Dr. Gilbert Mason and his wife, Natalie Hamler Mason. Miss Aria Mason, welcome. It's great to see you. How are you today? Yeah, I'm well. I'm so glad to be here. Glad to have you here, Aria. So can you tell us a little bit about the meaning of this mission of equal access to the sea, Aquamare? What does that mean to you? Um, it means so many things to me. Um, part of the reason that my grandfather um, was so focused on making sure that uh, everyone in Mississippi, anyone who wanted to visit, would also have an opportunity to enjoy the, the sea was that he had a profound love of the sea. He had a profound love of the water. Um, he was a, a champion swimmer in both high school and undergraduate um, at Tennessee State University. And when he moved to Biloxi with my grandmother, he was extremely excited initially because he was looking forward to partaking of all of the things that the coastal culture had to offer. Um, he was in fact named for two for an explorer, Sir Humphrey Gilbert. Um, and so, you know, interest in the water and marine life had always been a part of who he was, um, both as a, a person and as a scientist. Uh, and as a an Eagle Scout. And so, you know, initially I just think of the kind of access that is often denied to people who look different from the people who make the rules. In this country that has historically meant that people who look like me have been underserved and um, different, disenfranchised from being able to reach their highest potential as human beings. And so anything that involves equal access to me means speaking to the differences that we can see, 
but also speaking to the differences of how we move through the world mentally, physically, and spiritually. And I, I really welcome the opportunity that the consortium has come, come through with and, and espoused to make sure that what happens um, in the life of the and in terms of its research mission also speaks to the fact that we want to um, introduce the sea to more people and we want to introduce more people to the sea and to and to interpreting it through their perspective. So I hope that's illuminative. It sure is. Thank you for illuminating us, Aria. And it's a good segue into our next guest, Leila Hamden, who is the Associate Director of the School of Ocean Science and Engineering and Associate Professor of the Division of Coastal Sciences at the University of Southern Mississippi. She's also the President-Elect for the Coastal and Estuarine Research Federation, which advances understanding and wise stewardship of estuarine and coastal ecosystems worldwide. Leila, it's so good to be here with you. Can you tell us a little bit about when we're talking about access, as Aria just put it, it's not just physical that we have to think about. It's not just, there's many forms of it. And tell us a little bit about access and how in your lived experiences, you've seen this sort of play out. Yeah, thank, thanks so much, Alex. And thanks for the invitation to be here. It's, it's very exciting. And um, it, there's there's so much to unpack with what Aria uh, just said. In just the word access itself, um, I, I really like digging into the meaning of words. And it's not it's not just about entry. It's of course it's about lowering lowering barriers that stand in the way to getting into the door. Um, but it's also about having the chance to approach a new door in the first place. And and that, you know, that really hits home with me, especially today. Um, it, it comes pretty close. Uh, uh, today um, would have been my dad's 80th birthday, and um, it's also the same day that I defended my dissertation uh, 18 years ago. It, it was not an accident uh, that the two days coincided. I, I picked this day, you know, to honor um, his memory, but also um, the dreams that he had for me and, and, and my sisters, and a lot of those dreams really did focus in at the nexus of access. And um, for, for him in his, you know, in his life, in his lived experience, um, he was born uh, under occupation in Palestine in the 1940s. And, you know, the, he dreamed of a lot of things as a child, simple things, you know, like freedom of, of movement and freedom to open doors. And those things in, in his and his youth were not in his grasp. So he did leave his home at age 22. Um, he crossed an ocean. He arrived in the United States in, in northern New Jersey, um, probably the most different place, you know, that he could have ended up from where he was born. Um, and it was exciting and it was challenging. Uh, but even when he arrived at this, this new door and these new shores, he didn't always have access to, you know, his dreams. And and so, you know, he he lived a life where I think maybe he was dreaming ideas and, and things for himself, but he, but he was also dreaming things for um, me and and my sisters. And he worked incredibly hard to um, to put us in positions where we could also, you know, dream about access forward. And uh, you know, one of the things that he did was he took us to the beach every year, the the Jersey Shore, and it was. It was crowded and it was fun and it was mysterious and you only realize decades later you know that those little gifts that the people that dreamed for you are what set your career in motion and give you the keys to unlock these important doors that we have in our lives that is so powerful Layla. thank you for telling us a little bit about that story your story and your family story so I just want to reach out to the audience here and remind everybody that this is an interactive program. So speaking of dreams, if you have a dream of getting your question answered in Ocean Classroom Live, now's the time to do it. Write your questions in the chat and let us know. But really, while we're waiting for those questions to come in and to see where that kind of steers us, I want to really address something with Layla and Aria, uh, with the both of you. And you both come from such powerful places and such powerful experiences and these stories that are handed down. And I think something that's really important to focus on, and, and Layla, you just kind of touched on it, was this, this idea of going to the beach. 
this idea of exploration, what ships can do for us, these are CRVs, they, they're going to take us far out into the ocean, deep down into the ocean. They're going to allow scientists to study these areas. But there's a different type of exploration that we can do while we're at the beach. But sometimes that access to the beach, it hasn't always been as equal. So it's not only access to the sea and the deep sea, but Aria, can you tell us a little bit of, about a story when this really sunk in for you, that equal access to the sea wasn't just doing research at sea? Absolutely. Um, there were there were two moments in my life where I could really have a greater understanding of, of what access means and also what the price of, of trying to acquire it can have. Um, for those who are willing to journey out to be the wayfarers of, of obtaining that. When I was um, a, a young kid, I actually was a part of the JSL, JL Scott Marine Education Center's yearly camp um, for budding marine biologists. And when I was in the, I did it for three years. And when I was in the camp my second year, we were planning on going on an excursion to Ship Island. And my grandfather uh, decided to usurp my mother's uh, place as a chaperone and come along for the journey, in part because he had never had the opportunity to explore um, the coastline and its life uh, after having fought so hard to get access to it and obtain access for everyone else. And his palpable joy at being a part of the exploration team was, uh, you know, infectious. You just couldn't, you couldn't get past um, seeing how excited he was to be a part of everything. And in his own little gruff way, his cute way, he made sure that everybody was imbued with that same infectious excitement. Um, and for me as a kid, you know, my grandfather had a, uh, he was sweet and lovable, but he was also sometimes, you know, taciturn and he was about his business. So getting to see him just like, I'm going to go out here and I'm going to learn about plankton. I'm going to go out and look at some sharks, granddaughter, you know, was very exciting for me. Um, but in a more profound way, uh, the lesson um, hammered home for me uh, later on when I was a senior in high school and he was in the midst of the initial publication of his book, Beach's Blood and Ballads. Um, and my mom and I had taken him out to lunch. My grandmother had passed away not long before that. And we decided to stop by the beach after we ate and got out of the car and went and sat with him just on the seawall and just watched him watch children playing and families interacting, people walking along the shore, black and white. And, you know, he had had a stroke not long before and very surprisingly uh, just kind of shared, started sharing his feelings, he was visibly moved by the sight of it. And he, he was holding my hand and he looked at me and he looked at my mom and he kind of looked out at the water and he said, I, you know, I did this for you. I did this for you and I didn't even know that you were coming. Um, that touched me, you know, touched me so much. Um, and he reiterated it in his oral history that became the book talking about how he wanted to make a world for me that he could conceive of before I was even a thought. And, um, you know, that's what true pioneering is. Um, that's what trailblazing really is, that you have the, the courage to conceive of a reality for someone that you don't know for yourself, that is more open, that is more um, in, embracing, that has greater possibility than you can even perceive in your own life. And um, those two moments have, have stayed with me so much for that re those reasons. Now, you mentioned something that he called you uh, granddaughter. Yes. And that was that, that was a common thing. He, did he call you Aria often or was it? He never called me Aria. 
I don't ever remember hearing him say my name, even when he was mentioning me to someone else. Um, so when I was born, yeah, most of you may know, but you may not, that aria is an operatic term. It is the opera operatic solos that are like character exposition in an opera. My mother is an opera singer, and as fate would have it, I also became an opera singer. But when I was born, he was like, well, she's too small to be an aria. She's just an heir. He didn't really know that the terms were kind of interchangeable, so he called me Miss Air. I was just a little aria to him. So he all, only either called me Miss Air or granddaughter, he called my mother daughter, and he called my grandmother spouse, and she called him spouse. And the third term that was used pretty interchangeably was the baby. I'm the only grandchild. Um, and so, you know, if I called the house, hey, spouse, the baby's on the phone. It doesn't work as well when you're 20 and you're coming to pick him up from somewhere and he tells people that the baby is coming to get him. So, and then you pull up and they're like, who's the baby y'all? Um, so yeah, I was never, I, I never heard him say, hey, Aria. I never even heard him refer to me as that. So the, all the stories usually involve some iteration of granddaughter. <laughs> I love that, that's awesome. Uh, and the story you told about being at the beach with him and uh, this moment where the the challenges and sort of approaching these challenges from a fearless stance, it really comes from a place where you're thinking about people behind you. You're thinking about people that may not even exist yet. So maybe maybe it was even giving a name to you. You just wanted to keep true to that. Absolutely. And you know, <laughs> I also want to, you know, I, I would love to just introduce the thought that fearlessness is sometimes overrated. Um, fear is a, is a superpower if you allow it to become so, right? I think that there were a lot of times when he was absolutely, you know, driven by pure courage. You know, he was just willing to just go through the fire because he thought that he had the providence and the dedication and the capacity to will something into existence. But I know that there were other times that he was afraid. It was absolutely um, detrimental to them to be going and pursuing this line of work in a place where they had no family, they had no roots. My grandfather was from Jackson, which is close by, but it's not immediately nearby. Their, uh, his car was blown up, their house was almost bombed, his office was, was set on fire, they had constant death threats. They had to have round the clock security. Um, my father grew up in an environment of um, a great deal of uncertainty and things changing uh, all of the time because in addition to the threats that they were receiving, they were under constant surveillance from the Sovereignty Commission. And I know that from my grandmother, um, a lot of what was going on to her was incredibly, um, unnerving. And I, I want us to kind of get to a place where we understand as a culture, and maybe I'm, I'm getting too deep for, if, and for a second here. I want us to get to a place where we understand that, that sometimes we should embrace fear and see where it leads us. You know, the thing that you're, when you're feeling the fear, it's usually a good indicator that you're on the right track. If you're doing something with your life that doesn't make you wonder, can I do this? Do I have it? Can I go on? Maybe you're not doing the thing that is truly your purpose and what you're being divinely inspired to do. And I I want to I want to emphasize that because so many people, especially in the days that we're living in, think that fighting for your rights, fighting for privileges and 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 the fullness of your humanity is just something that should be apparent and that you should just, you know, power through that. But there's there's something to be discovered about yourself through sitting with the fear and deciding how you're gonna let that take you to the next place. I mean, how many of the of the greatest oceanographers and marine biologists have done similar work thinking along the same lines, you know? There's so much unknown about the ocean. There's so much that can be taken away from us 
from exploring the ocean just in a physical sense. And so we really have such a great opportunity with the ship to, you know, all, the thing about equal access is also an equal access to tapping into the potential inside of you, you know, and, and, not, and not being afraid to do that. My grandfather constantly, constantly pursued that um, as, as his life's work. And so I, I want to I want to make that clear. Clear, crystal, <laughs> absolutely. I and I, I agree with you. I think that is something that we we tend to underestimate how our emotions can be um, signposts that can let us know where to go on certain directions. And and I love that you tied that all into ocean science. And we have an ocean scientist with us today, Layla. I'm I'm curious. Like ocean science can be pretty scary to people. It can be um, stepping onto a ship for the first time, or even going out and putting your head underwater. I remember when I was a kid, I was sometimes uncomfortable with that. But you have made a career of being an ocean scientist now. What are some of the ways that you, maybe there's a certain example or a certain something in your past that you were able to sort of connect the dot and say, you know what, this was a little bit scary for me, but I'm seeing where this led to. And I'm glad I followed this signpost or this emotion, this fear, and you really took a stance for it. I, I could spend an hour talking about the times that I have been afraid uh, <laughs> as an ocean scientist. Um, you know, one that comes to mind when, when Aria was talking about fear being a motivator, um, I was thinking about the first time that I uh, led a remotely operated vehicle mission uh, on a ship as, as the chief scientist. And, you know, you, you do what you can to prepare for um, oceanographic research to, to be, you know, to be ready to go, to make sure your team knows what they're doing. But there comes this moment where you come to realize, I don't know what I'm doing. Um, and I, I think it's okay to admit that sometimes. And, and it's, it's been something I've been trying to do with my own students is let them know that I don't always know what I'm doing. And there are times when I'm really struggling to, you know, to figure out what's the right thing to do and what, you know, what comes next. And on that particular, you know, occasion where, you know, it was my first shot um, leading a mission like that, which has so much at stake, um, you know, it's, it's expensive and it's dangerous and it's, you know, there's just a lot of, on the line, both in terms of science and reputation. And I was in my cabin, you know, it was a particularly unpleasant day at sea as well. So I wasn't feeling too great. And I was thinking, you're blowing it. You know, this, this is just all going sideways. And, and, and I kept thinking about how would X person do this? You know, my, my colleagues from other universities, how would this other person do it? And I, I realized what the problem was, what I was dealing with was I was trying to jam myself into a mold that wasn't me. I was trying to do my science a way that, that didn't reflect um, myself, my experience, my, um, my own value, and I was trying to be someone else. And um, as soon as I got to understand that and, and realized, no, you, you can do this and you belong here, just as much as any of those other people belong here, um, things things really turned around. It, it helped that the weather cleared up too, and you know, <laughs> and equipment started working again. But it was it was fear that I could taste, and and I completely agree with Aria that sometimes you have to just you have to eat that fear. You have to use it as fuel to keep you pushing forward. I mean public speaking <laughs> that is that's another place that you know I, I may not I may not show it always outwardly but you know on some physiological level my body still knows to be terrified of of speaking you know even in a forum like this because it's the self doubt it's the you know the decades of conditioning of of what a marine scientist is supposed to look like or sound like and, and you know and how and how you, you don't always measure up to that. And then, you know, and then turning that into fuel for yourself. And, you know, that that comes back to the the topic of access, you know, and and there are there are so many there are so many physical things that we could do with with research vessels, you know, ways that we can make them 
um, more physically accessible. We can create, you know, data presence and telepresence and, you know, enable uh, everyone to lend their eyes and ears and their voices to scientific missions from wherever they are. Um, this fleet of vessels also has mobility accessible um, uh, cabins um, for, for researchers to join uh, science, um, you know, even if, if they, you know, have, have their own personal and physical challenges to allow them to get onto the ships. And, and so, you know, the, the, the cabins are in, on the main deck where we have the labs and the common spaces and, and all of our, our research facilities. And, and all of that's, you know, so completely important. Uh, but it's not just about the physical manifestations of, of access. It's how we imagine what a marine scientist looks like. Or sounds like, or you know, you know, just all of the all of the pieces of that, and and how you know we start building in um, a new mindset, so that we're not always trying to compare ourselves to a precast mold of what that marine scientist looks like, because that is a huge barrier to access. Um, you know, expecting folks to come through a specific academic pedigree. Um, or, you know, a, a familial tradition of having academics in your family, that creates, that creates access to only one, you know, sector of our population. And, you know, someone who, you know, worked through college or, you know, took on responsibilities as a kid to support a single parent and, and really knows like a, a really deep work ethic, but maybe didn't always get the best grades or got into the best colleges, who are we to say that they're not just as capable and of being a good marine scientist, but maybe excellence in marine science that we never imagined before? And so it's it's so important for us to be talking about those things and thinking about what the the uh, the intellectual activity of creating access um, looks like, and it, that wraps right back to fear too. It's a scary thing for an institution or an individual to to look at themselves and say, "Well, how are we doing?" You know, and and we're we're actually trying to do that at University of Southern Mississippi. We knew when when we um, embraced this name of of Gilbert Mason for this vessel, we knew that we were putting up a high bar, and we knew that our our record of equity was going to come up for scrutiny. And we leaned into it, you know, intentionally leaned into it and said, so let's scrutinize ourselves. Let's look, um, a, a colleague of mine, Beatrice uh, Wilson, she, she said, let's look at um, what your, your family or your class photo looks like. You know, is it, is it the vision of equity um, that it should be? And if it's not, are you all brave enough to go there? And we are. And, and so, you know, Aria, thank you for the, you know, the, the note on fear. It's, it's really an it's powerful. It really is a motivator. I couldn't agree with you more. Yeah, I appreciate Thank that. And and um, something that I spoke to in my in my speech at the Keeling last year, you know, was also talking about as far as we've come as a society, how much we how far we still have yet to go in terms of uh, who's represented who's represented, excuse me, in the uh, field of science and in medicine. Only 2% of all doctors in the United States are Black women, 2% in 2021. Um, and in ocean science, it, it seems that there's even less than that. And um, the numbers that I saw that was between 1976 and 2016, only 1% 1 of doctorates were issued to African-Americans. Um, that's astounding. Even as far as we have come, we have we have so far to go, and and even for me as a young girl, uh, when I was a young girl, I know I'm old now. Uh, when I was in marine biology camp, I did not have anybody to look up to uh, as a as an instructor, but also as someone who. I could see aspirationally who was a known scientist that was not, Neil deGrasse Tyson was not culturally ubiquitous at that time. The most, uh, the greatest frame of reference I had for myself was Mae Jemison. And um, even Mae Jemison 
was an, uh, an active astronaut for a very long period of time. And can anyone name a Mae Jemison of today? Is there someone who seems so culturally relevant uh, to the world of science as a black woman, um, as a woman of color in, in our current society? You know, there's, there may be, um, I hope, and I, and I know that Layla hopes as well, as well as the, everybody else at Memcon and USM, that there is potential for us to widen the opportunities for research, development, exploration, for not just students at USM or students through, N, through the NSF and through LUMCOM, but also to expand the field to HBCUs and other non-traditional paths of study for people to you know, be able to be a part of what the missions uh, of the ship are and what the, you know, the particular uh, expeditions are as well. I know I'm hoping to put my little opera singer self out there and, you know, sing sea shanties and whatever else I need to do to pay my, pay my toll to get on the ship. <laughs> that would be so powerful. <laughs> An opera for the ocean. I'm I looking forward to that. Shanty. I will learn one. Yeah. And it's almost like, you know, the, this, this idea of signposting, this idea of emotions being signposted and fear and, and being able to take these stances. It's almost like the conversations that we're having today, and we have them here at GSO too. We're asking science to embrace this fear, almost as an entire field of study. And I think that's really important. And I think it's also really scary for a lot of people. But I think both of you are just inspiring with the words that you and the stories that you put out there and the bravery in your stances. And specifically, can, can one institution do this alone? I and mean, you both kind of touched on it. But as we wrap up here, we, we always like to sort of leave, leave the audience with something to think about. And, you know, you mentioned the consortium and um, the, the sort of multiple institutions that are leaning into that fear, leaning into the how are we going to be better at this? You know, Layla, let's start, let's start with you. And, and can this be done with one institution? It should never be done with one institution. You know, you you create, uh, you may create a an island, but an island is not enough, and that island is not going, it's not going to create a career trajectory for anyone who comes up in that island. So we we have to be doing this together. Um, we we do have for the operation of this ship a consortium of eighteen universities throughout the uh, Gulf uh, of Mexico and Caribbean. Um, which, uh, you know, will be all in on creating um, programs, you know, that, that have funding and that have, uh, have a vision and a plan for creating access for students coming into ocean and marine science. Uh, the work has already started. Um, we, we at USM have a uh, undergraduate internship for ocean exploration with Tuskegee University. Uh, where we are bringing undergrad students into the art and the science of ocean exploration, uh, putting them in labs, putting them on ships. Um, but from there, you know, they have to have some place to go next, you know, the, the next step in their career to graduate school. We certainly hope they'll come to graduate school at our university. But of course, after that, there has to be the career path. So we all have to be building this together. Um, we also have um, internship programs with two HBCUs in the state of Mississippi, uh, Jackson State and Alcorn State, um, which are gonna follow a very sim similar model of you know, creating, creating the access points, but then this holistic network of, of where the students go next. And you know, it, it, it's, this is not altruistic at all. This helps science, this helps us become more excellent. This brings in new perspectives, new ideas, new ways of looking at the same fish, the same microbe, the same spot of seafloor and seeing something that none of us have ever seen before. Um, so by doing this and doing this together, what, what we are going to do for science is limitless. And I, you know, I, I hope that anybody that's watching this knows that um, it's okay to be afraid of you know, starting new programs, it's okay to be afraid to look um, inward at your own institution and see how you're doing, and then just lean into that fear and start making the change that we need to make ocean science everything that it could be. Aria, I, I think 
you would come from a different place on this and in, in not a better or worse way, but just from a different place, especially with your focus on the arts. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Layla, for that. That was just incredibly powerful. I couldn't agree more. But Aria, what your your thoughts on how we can leave the audience today about equal access, opening up this idea? You know, um, I keep hearing for, for for whatever reason, since we started this uh, conversation, I keep hearing the the words of "We shall not be moved." Um, a song my grandfather loved, and uh, actually in my undergraduate senior recital, I sang in dedication to him and my grandmother um, singing protest songs from the movement. I, I keep thinking of the lyric, just like a tree planted by the water, you know? How much stronger are what we see um, our bald cypress trees here in New Orleans and in Louisiana? How much stronger are we when we have been infused with the thing that is that makes up a great mass of who we are. You know, I think that there's so much to be discovered from really tapping into what we really are as American institutions, as, as an American populace, who we really are, what have what have the best of what has made us who we are, and how can we make sure that those people who have built this nation, who have have put so much of what we honor in ourselves literally on their backs and in their sweat, blood and tears into seeing how we can go further as a society. You know, the sky's not the limit, the sky's the beginning. You know, I look forward so much to what the, the RV Gilbert R. Mason can do, not just in his name, but in his spirit, uh, in Natalie Hamlin Mason's spirit, and I hope someday in my own, I hope that um, we will be like trees planted by water and we won't be moved in our determination to keep growing and keep striving for ways to better ourselves. And I also think of this other you know, quote that's off often quoted from President Kennedy about that, how tied we are to the sea and that when we explore the sea, that we're going back to whence we came. You know, as a, as a historian, it is always pro profound to me to be able to see what shoulders I'm standing on when I'm doing research and when I look into from a perspective as, as my role as opera creole, um, who, what other classical composers and musicians came before me that I didn't even know existed, who, who dreamt of a world and fought for civil rights and access and published and performed and wrote when people told them that they weren't even full human beings so that I can get out there and, and dance in the light and make it possible for other people to hear their music. I, I wonder what what future scientists, oceanographers, marine biologists are going to create a world pioneering for another little girl who may look like me or think like me or sing like me uh, or a little boy or any permutation therein down the line. Um, and I, I look forward to being a part of the process and especially knowing that this little girl this future scientist or diva, you know, that hand that you, extraneous hand you see is my mother's, um, that she can explore whatever is in her heart and mind and uh, share in her great grandparents' legacy. <laughs> this is so touching. Oh my God. <laughs> um, I Amara Mason Foles. Hello, Amara. My little baby. She's been talking the in the future throughout. She's the future. So. Uh, there's something so, um, something that really is resonating deeply with me is this idea that um, this may seem like we're, we're talking pie in the sky, right? These altruistic ideas, right? But I want everybody in the audience to recognize something that it still comes down to the person or the, the people being fearless in their stances, being passionate about what they're doing, and in thinking about people that may not even exist yet, 
to come from a path that they're going to forge ahead. And with that, I, Arya, Layla, Amara, thank you so much for today, for opening up, for letting us know about your stories. And I hope everybody really appreciated that. Thank you, Alex. This was fun. <laughs> yeah, this was a blast. It's an honor to be a part of this. Thank you so much. Two-way street. So with that, we'll close out today's episode. I can't thank you enough for being here with us, for kind of leaning into this subject matter with us, because it's not always easy to talk about, but we get somewhere. It's productive. We get to digest it together, and then we can all sort of grow together in the same aspect. So this is kind of wraps our the three-part series for the RCRVs, the Ocean Classroom Live here at GSO, where we connect audiences to ocean science through conversation. Our final episode is going to be of the season, actually, of our season two here is going to be on July 1. And we're going to celebrate 60 years of GSO. So it's going to be a GSO centric where we get to really lean into our past a little bit. And if you don't already, follow us on social media, the GSO, and also our partners too with USM and LUMCON. And thanks again to the Deborah Ocean Foundation. And with that, we'll see you later. It's great to be here with you. <laughs>